Well, good morning. It's great to see you this morning. It's a gorgeous day that we've been blessed with, and um, we're glad that you're here this morning to worship God. Um, welcome to the Walter Hill Church. We're thankful for your presence. In the seat in front of you, you should find a card. If you'll take one of those cards and fill it out, pass it to the inside aisles, and they'll be um, collected um, towards the end of the service. The first two songs will be displayed on the screen behind me this morning, and um, if you would at this time um, stand for the reading of our scripture and then remain standing for these first two songs. In John chapter 11, <clears throat> Jesus spoke to Mary, I mean to Martha. Um, her brother Lazarus had recently um, died, and um, she was um, um, mourning the loss of her brother. But Jesus spoke words to her that I think are very appropriate for us today. And, Martha, uh, and Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. Martha said to him, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection on the last day. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. And everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? She said to him, Yes, Lord, I believe that you are the Christ, the Son of God, who is coming into the world. Let us worship him, the one that has come into the world. Oh, spread the tiny
next song this morning will be number 237, His Grace Reaches Me.
Join with me as we pray together, please. Loving and Holy Father in heaven, we come before you this morning mindful of our shortcomings, mindful of our failures, with awe and deep appreciation for the constant consistency of your love, the provisions of your providential care, and for our Savior, Jesus Christ. Father, you know we lack consistency in our love and devotion for you, and because of that, <clears throat> we thank you for your long-suffering and patience in our lives. We pray, Father, that we will allow you to continue to mold and shape us in your image. Help us, Father, to honor and respect your word and to live it out in our lives. Help us to love one another. Father, we're mindful of the freedom we still have today to gather together and worship. We pray for boldness in the days ahead as that freedom is under assault in the world. Father, we pray you'll bless and strengthen the church at Walter Hill. Thank you for loving us. And we offer this prayer in the Savior's name, Jesus Christ. Amen. I hope you get your Bible and read along with us today this exciting story of Jonah. And we appreciate uh, the lessons that we've heard, and uh, we shall continue this story. Look in chapter 3, and beginning in verse 10. Then God saw their works, that they turned from their evil way. And God relented from the disaster that he had said he would bring upon them, and he did not do it. But it displeased Jonah exceedingly, and he became angry. So he prayed to the Lord and said, O oh Lord, was not this what I said when I was still in my country? Therefore I fled previously to Tarshish. For I know that you are a gracious and merciful God, slow to anger, and abundant in loving kindness, one who relents from doing harm. Therefore now, O Lord, please take my life from me, for it is better for me to die than to live. <sighs> Before our offering, we'll sing number 184, God is the Fountain Winds. God is We've come to the point in our service where we will take up an offering, and this is how the Lord funds His works. And the emphasis is this is how the Lord funds His works 
at this local congregation. It's not how we fund the works. The Lord is the one who is funding through us and our giving back. If you are visiting with us, feel free to pass this tray right on by you. This is an expectation that we have for the members here, that the Lord had for the members here, that you will give back as you have prospered. So let us give uh, thanks before we take up the offering. Lord, we are so thankful and blessed that you give us the privilege to come and worship you with our offerings. We pray that we do so with a cheerful, cheerful heart and that our offering is acceptable to you. It's in your son's name, Jesus, we pray. Amen. In preparation for the Lord's Supper, we'll sing number 764, When We Meet in Sweet Communion. And immediately following communion, we'll sing number 876, Jesus' Name Above All Names. <laughs>
During the last week of Jesus' life, we can read where he observed the Passover feast that one last time. We can read about that in Luke 22. And at that time is when he instituted the Lord's Supper. To, he would not eat or take of the fruit of the vine until he comes again. And we can look at that and we know that's the day he established what we are doing today. And if we turn over to John chapter 20, we play this forward a little bit. Jesus instituted the Lord's Supper there. He was betrayed that night, then he was taken, beaten, tried, beaten some more, crucified. He's in the grave. And then Sunday comes. We start reading in John chapter 20, verse 1. Now on the first day of the week, when Mary Magdalene had came to the tomb early, while it was still dark, and she saw that the stone had been rolled away from the tomb. So she ran and went to Simon Peter and the other disciples, the one whom Jesus loved. And she said to them, They have taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we do not know where they have laid him. So Peter ran out with other disciples, and they were going towards the tomb. Both of them were running together, but the other disciple outrun Peter and reached the tomb first. And stooping, looked in, he saw the linen cloth laying there, but he did not go in. Then Simon Peter came, following him, and went into the tomb. He saw the linen cloth lying there, and the face cloth, which had been put on Jesus' head, not lying with the linen cloth, but folded up and placed by itself. Then the other disciple, who had reached the tomb first, also went in and saw and believed. For as yet they did not understand the scripture that he must be risen from the dead. Then the disciples went back to their homes. But Mary stood weeping outside the tomb, and she wept, and she stooped and looked in the tomb, and she saw two angels in white sitting there where the body of Jesus had lain, one at the head and one at the feet. They said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? She said to them, They have taken away my Lord and I do not know where they have laid him. Having said this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there, but she did not know that it was Jesus. Jesus said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you seeking? Suppose him to be the gardener, she said to him, Sir, if you have carried him away, please tell me where you have laid him, and I'll take him away. Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned and said in Aramaic, Rabboni, which means teacher, and Jesus said to her, Do not cling to me, for I have not yet ascended to the Father. But go, tell my brothers, and say to them, I ascend to the Father and your Father, to my God and your God. And Mary Magdalene went and announced to the disciples, I have seen the Lord, and that he had said these things to her. It's a very exciting time right there, the first day of the week, same day that we are worshiping the Lord today, remembering the happenings of his life that he is risen from the dead and the excitement there. And one thing you can read, in, you, you read in that verse there where the, the face cloth of the linen was folded and put up. So there's one key indicator there. There was no hurry to get out of that grave. They just didn't take stuff and steal the body and throw stuff around. He neatly folded that and put that down in its place. So the first day of the week is when he had risen. And if we turn over to chapter or Acts, chapter 20 and verse 7 we can see an example of the disciples of Christ what were they doing Acts 20 verse 7 on the first day of the week when we were gathered together to break bread Paul talked to them intended to depart the next day and he prolonged his speech until midnight so they're the first day of the week again the same day Jesus was risen that's when the disciples were gathering to break bread and then we can see other examples of that. I'm going to turn over to 1 Corinthians chapter 11. If we go down to starting in verse 23, this is the Apostle Paul talking to the church there. I received from the Lord also which I delivered to you that the Lord on the night when he was betrayed took bread and we had given thanks. He broke it and said, this is my body which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, when he took the cup after supper, saying, This is the cup of the new covenant, which is my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance as me. 
For as oft as you eat this bread, drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. And that's what we're doing today, remembering the great sacrifice our Lord gave to us. The first day of the week, he was risen from the dead, an example in the Bible that they assembled on the first day of the week. And so we assemble today on the first day of the week and do the same thing. Let us give thanks for what the God has done for us in the breaking of the bread. Lord, we lift you up as the Almighty, the creator of this universe, the author of our salvation. Lord, as we reflect on the great sacrifice that your son gave us, that he was willing to give up his home in heaven, to come be born in a manger, to live the life he did with no home, and to ultimately be willing to suffer the way he suffered for our sins, and that he was willing to go to that cross to be crucified in our place. Lord, we can't thank you enough for that sacrifice, knowing he was the perfect lamb, and how we can reflect on the Bible and understand the meaning of that lamb through the Old Testament and the sacrifice that was needed for us. Lord, pray that you, we pray that you would bless us as we partake of this bread in the remembrance of his body. And it's his name we pray, Jesus. Amen. Let's continue our prayer. Lord, we're so thankful for the shedding of the blood of our precious Savior. And on that first day of the week that he was risen, that he was risen, that he was risen, that we know that we have that assurance that one day we will be risen to be able to live throughout eternity in glory all because of his blood. Lord, help us not to forget that. Lord, as we partake of this, help us not to forget our brothers and sisters, maybe ones who are struggling, ones who we need to talk to. Help us to understand that this blood is so precious, so precious that we want to share it. 
And it's in your great son's name we pray, Jesus. Amen. Jesus, name above all names, beautiful Savior, glorious Lord, Emmanuel, God is with us, blessed Redeemer. of the lesson this morning your invitation song will be number 588 sinners jesus will receive we'll sing the first second and fourth verses at that time and now before the lesson we'll sing number 646 the love of god if it's convenient for you would you please stand the love of god
Please be seated. Tim was entranced by the book. He couldn't believe it. He went out on the back porch and four hours had passed. But it was a great book. And after every page as he turned, he, he couldn't put it down. He had to know, how's the story going to end? Well, what's, what's going to happen in this story? And as he neared the end of the book, he, he began to think about this will be the ending. This is how the story is going to end. And he had this picture in his mind. And he nears the end. He, he turns the page and all of a sudden he noticed the page. It was blank. What happened? How could the story end? It, it, wasn't, supposed to, it wasn't supposed to end like this. There was supposed to be more to the story. The, the, the good guys were supposed to, to win. But that's not how it happened. You know, when you read books and when you watch movies, you know, we, we like to think about how the story is going to end, don't we? And in our minds, you know, we, we get to the end of the story, and as long as it ends kind of the way we expected it to end, it was a good book. It was a good movie. But if it ends differently... If all of a sudden there's some kind of twist in the story at the very end that leaves us scratching our heads, I mean, we didn't see it coming, and I guess in one sense that's kind of neat, but in another sense, how could they? How could they not end it with the hero winning? How could the boy not get the girl, right? Like, we have expectations. And when you read the story of Jonah, the story of Jonah is an interesting story because the story of Jonah doesn't end the way we would expect it to. In fact, as you read through the story of Jonah, we would expect Jonah to stop at the end of chapter 3, in verse number 10, where there God sees what they, the Ninevites, have done, how they've turned from their wicked ways, and, and God, well, he relents of the disaster that he said he would do to them, and he doesn't do it. See, if I were writing the story of Jonah, if you were writing the story of Jonah, this is how the story would end. It ends in such an amazing way. God calls his prophet, his prophet, a little reluctant in the beginning, eventually goes. He preaches this message to this group of wicked people. There's this great response to the point that the whole city uh, grieves over what they've done. They call for a fast, even amongst the animals, and they repent of their evil ways. And God spares them. Well, that's a good ending. And that's the way the story, in our minds, well, that's the way it ought to end. But then you look a little closer in your Bible. And right as you get to the end of, of, of verse number 10 there, and you see where God relents of what he said he would do, you see this word, but. <laughs> that word's not supposed to be there. The story of Jonah is supposed to be over. The story of Jonah was supposed to end with the, the wicked people repenting of their sins, of their wicked ways. But there it is, staring right back at us, indicating us that the story is, well, it's not over. We may want it to end. We, we may have thought, hey, that was a great place to end the story, God. But God says, no, 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 no. There's more to the story. As Paul Harvey would say, there's the rest of the story. And then you begin to read, and you begin to notice that here in the latter parts of the story of Jonah, this is the part of the story that we talk about the least. And I think it's because we really like the way it ends in chapter 3. But chapter 4 is one of the most important parts of the entire story of Jonah because it's in chapter 4 in the life of Jonah that we really begin to understand and to see what the story of Jonah is all about. God relents of what he said he would do, and he doesn't do it to Nineveh. But Jonah was displeased exceedingly, and he was... Notice that next word. He was angry. I want you to think about what it is that makes you angry. 
You know, you think about things that can make you angry. You know, if you go to the, the freezer to get some ice cream and you pull out the carton and you take the top off and you look down and you realize someone put the ice cream back in the freezer but there's not really any ice cream in the carton anymore. Or if there is, it's like enough for like one little spoon. Like, what's that even worth? You know, that can cause you to be a little angry, can it? But that's not what we're talking about. Because the word angry here in the Hebrew literally means burning hot. Jonah was burning hot about something. Now when we think about anger like that, you begin to think, okay, there's things that make us burn hot, right? There are things that can get us angry. You know, I get angry when I see people mistreated. I burn hot when I see people abused. That makes me angry. Maybe that makes you angry. But I want you to notice what makes Jonah angry. Jonah's not angry uh, over the fact that, that someone is abused. Jonah isn't uh, angry over the fact that there's no ice cream in, in the ice cream carton, right? Here's what Jonah's angry about. Jonah's angry about what just happened. See, the beginning of verse 4 with the word but points back to the end of chapter 3 and verse 10. Where there God relents of the disaster that he said he would do to the Ninevites. And when God relents and God doesn't do it, the Bible says, Jonah, he's angry. What should have been a joyous time. What should have been a celebration was anything but a celebration. Because Jonah's not happy about what happened. In fact, he's burning hot and he's so angry that all of a sudden Jonah, I notice, begins to pray. And this is the second time we read about Jonah praying here in the, the life of Jonah, the book of Jonah. And it's interesting as you read about Jonah praying, the first time Jonah prays is back in chapter 2. And, and there in chapter 2, he prays this prayer of penitence. I'm in the fish's belly, right? I've been swallowed up, but I realize I'm wrong. And if you get me out of here, I will fulfill my vow. I will do what you've called me to do, God. And God causes that great sea monster to spit up Jonah. And Jonah goes and he preaches. But now he's praying a second time and he's not praying a, a prayer of penitence anymore. He's praying a prayer where he's pouting. He's pouting to God and he says, God, I'm angry. God, I'm displeased. And then notice what he says. Is this not what I said when I was yet in my country? That is why I made haste to flee to Tarshish, for I knew that you were a gracious God, merciful, slow to anger, abounding in steadfast love, and relenting from disaster. Jonah prays and he begins to pout and says, God, listen, and he tells us, here's the real reason I ran. I didn't run because the Ninevites were evil. I didn't run because I was scared for my life, what they would do to me. I ran because, God, I had some knowledge. I knew something, God. And it's interesting, the word knew there, for I knew, it says. That word literally means to know something from experience. You know, we know certain things from experience, don't we? I know from experience that the older I get, the less I can do with some of the things that I used to do. I know from experience that, you know, when I go to church camp every summer, I can't really play as hard as I once could 20 years ago. You know, I can't go down the slip and slide 25 times anymore. My body can't take that. And if I go down even once or twice, I have learned from experience I had better stretch or I'll pull a muscle. I know from experience. Jonah says, God, I know from experience. And notice what it is he knows. That you are a gracious God. That you give what isn't deserved. That you are a merciful God. That you don't give people the thing that they, they do deserve that you abound in steadfast love, that you're slow to anger, and that you relent from disaster. It's interesting, as Jonah is praying this prayer and as he's pouting to God, he's speaking back to God words that came from the very mouth of God. Back in Exodus chapter 34, when Moses is there and God is speaking to him after the incident of the, the, the uh, golden calf, God gives a self-description of it himself. And he says, Mo Moses, don't you know, I'm a gracious God. I'm merciful. 
I'm slow to anger. I am full of steadfast love, relenting of disaster. Jonah is telling God what God has already said about himself. God, I know this about you. I knew this is how you would be. And so notice Jonah's response. Therefore, this is Jonah's prayer. Oh Lord, please take my life, for it's better for me to die than to live. Here Jonah is, and Jonah says, I know about you, God. I know the kind of God you are. And you know what? Because of that, just take my life. What is it that's angering Jonah? What is it that's causing Jonah to, to burn with anger, to burn hot? It's the fact of God's grace. Jonah resented God's grace to the Ninevites. Those wicked people, they didn't deserve what God had to offer. God, I know that's how you are, but these people, no, 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 no. They don't deserve your grace. They don't deserve your mercy. God, here's what they deserve. They deserve your wrath. They're wicked. I want you to think about your life for just a moment. Are there, are there people in your life like that? People that when you think about them and you, you think about how they live, maybe you watch how they live, you think, man, they're, they're wicked people. They're evil people, mean people, bad people. You know, maybe it's, a, maybe it's that co-worker who really makes life miserable for you. It's that bully who's always picking on you, right? It's, it's, it's that different uh, political party. Boy, that, those people are wicked. It's our enemies, it's those other nations that want to do our good nation harm. I mean, you think about it. We would never come out and say, boy, I, God shouldn't be gracious to those people. I mean, how dare I ever say something like that? I may not utter those words, but I sometimes, maybe you can relate to this, may think something along the lines of something like this. Someday, those people, they're going to get what they deserve. Have you ever thought that? You ever thought that about somebody? <laughs> we think that, you know, you know what we're saying? I resent God's grace. Those people, they're too wicked. They don't deserve God's grace, so someday they're going to get what's coming to them. Oh, I can't wait for that day. And here Jonah is, and, and Jonah has gone, and he's preached, and he's preached this message, and, and, and in his mind, unfortunately, they've responded. They've repented. They've turned from their wickedness. And Jonah is angry because those people don't deserve that. And then God asked Jonah this question. The Lord says to Jonah, do you do well to be angry? You know, that's a question that God asked Jonah that we ought to ask ourselves. When it comes to those people, you know, those people that are so wicked and so evil, the people that, you know, we just don't have a lot of love for, do we do well to be angry about those people? You know, I think with our own lives, for a lot of us, we, we want God to show us grace and mercy. I, right? I'm glad that when it comes to my life, I'm glad that I serve a gracious and merciful God. Aren't you? Aren't you? Yeah, we are. I just don't want God's grace and mercy to go to those people who don't deserve it. Oh, I deserve it. I'm a good person compared to them. But they, they don't deserve it. What if God, think about this, what if God treated me the way I would like for God to treat those people? What if God's response to me was what I wish God's response was to those people that I have no love for? Things wouldn't be so well for me. So here Jonah is, and we get this, this glimpse of Jonah's heart that, that Jonah is a man who he resents God's grace, and he's angry, and the people have repented. And instead of, instead of staying and preaching to the people and, and really teaching, they've repented of their evil ways, but really teaching them about Jehovah, uh, about Yahweh, I want you to notice Jonah's response. He's so angry that verse 5 tells us Jonah went out of the city. And he sat down east of the city, and he made a booth for himself there. That's a shelter. And he sat under it in the shade, notice, till he should see what would become of the city. 
Jonah doesn't stick around. He doesn't explain God. He doesn't teach God. He just preaches this message. They repent. He kind of storms off as a pouting child might when they don't get their way. And he sits down, and notice, he sits down where he can see the city, where he can face the city, and where he can watch. And notice it says, till he can see what would become of the city. Here's a question. What's Jonah looking for? What is it that Jonah's watching for? Well, the Ninevites have already repented. They've already turned from their wickedness. God has already relented of his disaster that he said he would do to them. So what is it that Jonah's waiting on? Perhaps Jonah's waiting on God to change his mind. Perhaps Jonah's waiting on these people to decide, you know what, we don't want to do this. And turn back to their wicked ways. Perhaps what it is that Jonah is waiting on is he's waiting on this heavenly divine fireworks show that's going to start over the city of Nineveh. And he sits there and he watches. Why would Jonah do that? Well, Jonah resents God's grace to these people. They don't, they don't deserve God's grace. But here's what's interesting about Jonah. Not only does he resent God's grace, Jonah, he sees sin differently. And here's what I mean by that. When you think about Jonah, how quickly Jonah has forgotten his own actions. God calls his prophet Jonah to go preach a message that he would give him. And instead of going, he flees, 20, tries to flee 2,500 miles west in the opposite direction. Right, and God crosses this great storm, and, and, and you know, they throw him overboard. And remember what he told the sailors? Like, if you throw me overboard, the sea will be calm. But you know what Jonah's thinking when they throw me overboard? Hey, I'm going to die. I'm still not going to do what God asked me to do. And God has to appoint this fish, this great sea monster that, that, that you know, swallows Jonah and keeps him alive until he spits up and he goes to do what it is that God called him to do. I want you to think about something. How's Jonah's sin any better than that of the Ninevites? Or how is the sin of the Ninevites any worse than that of Jonas? Think about this. The Ninevites, they didn't know the Lord God, but Jonah did. The Ninevites, they, did, they didn't serve the Lord God, but Jonah did. The Ninevites, they didn't receive a, a divine revelation from God, but Jonah did. The Ninevites, they weren't a prophet of God, but Jonah was. How quickly Jonah has forgotten his own actions. See, he's looking at the Ninevites thinking they don't deserve God's grace because you know what? They're wicked and they're evil. They're bad people. And yet Jonah has demonstrated in his own life his own sins, his own problems, his own issues. But my sins aren't as bad as theirs. I'm not killing people, right? I, I, I'm not skinning people alive and, and burying them in the sand and, and doing all these bad things to people. I mean, I just ran from what God asked me to do. I just disobeyed God. That can't be so bad, can it? 1 John chapter 5 and verse 17, the apostle John says this, all wrongdoing is sin. All wrongdoing. And James in James chapter 2, verses 10 and 11, the brother of Jesus tells us that if we break one point of the law, you know what James says? He says you're guilty of the whole law. In other words, if you're a murderer, you're guilty of breaking the whole law. If you're an adulterer, you're guilty of breaking the whole law. If you're a liar, you're guilty of breaking the whole law. If you're disobedient to the commands of God, you're guilty of breaking the whole law. See, for Jonah, he looked at the people of Nineveh and he thought, they don't deserve God's grace. He resented God's grace to these people because they're very wicked. But Jonah quickly forgot. <laughs> oh, he quickly forgot about his own sin. He wanted God to be gracious and merciful to him, just not to those people. And sometimes in our lives, we're guilty of that too. I want God to be gracious. I want God to be merciful to me, just not to you. Oh, yeah, I'm, I sin. But in my mind, and if you're honest in your mind, our sins are never as bad as the sins of other people. At least that's how we view it. 
And so Jonah is praying, God, just, just let me die. I, I would rather die than see the people of Nineveh get, uh, be granted repentance uh, for you to relent your disaster upon them. They don't deserve it, God. And notice verse 6. Now the Lord God appointed a plant, and he made it come up over Jonah that it might be a shade over his head to save him from his discomfort. So Jonah was exceedingly glad because of the plant. As Jonah built this shelter, he's in, he's in a land where there wasn't a lot of trees, so the shelter that he, he made was probably made out of stones, and so there probably wasn't a rooftop, it was probably just sides, and so the sun could still bear down on him. And Jonah's sitting there, and he's watching to see what's going to happen to these people, and he becomes faint, and he becomes tired, and so God causes this, well, this plant to grow. And there's a lot of speculation on what this plant is, and but the idea is a, is a plant, now if this were a real plant, it would grow a little bit taller and its leaves would be a whole lot thicker. I had one in my office until a few weeks ago. They get pretty big. And the purpose is, well, for us it's to be pretty, right? We put it, we plant them, we want it to look nice, it's a decoration. But for Jonah, it's providing shade. And Jonah, how does he feel about it? The Bible says he's exceedingly glad. Once again, God is demonstrating grace to Jonah that he does not deserve. And God is comforting Jonah. But then you continue reading. But when dawn came the next day, God appointed a, a worm that attacked the plant so that it withered. And when the sun rose, God appointed a scorching east wind, and the sun beat down on his head and Jonah, so that Jonah was faint. Three times in chapter 4 and once at the end of chapter 1 with the fish, we see the words, God appointed and it's to remind us of the power of God has. God has power over nature and over all created things. And here Jonah is, and Jonah's enjoying that plant, and the next day, that plant's gone. All of a sudden, that shade, that comfort, it's no longer there, and Jonah is, is hot. And notice what happens. So he, that's Jonah, asks once again that he might die. He says, it's for it's better to me to die than to live. God, just take my life. I can't take it. It's not fair. And he's angry. In fact, he says, I'm angry, angry enough to die. The Hebrew literally means when it talks about Jonah being angry, that it was evil to Jonah, <laughs> that, that it was a great calamity. That's how Jonah feels about the whole situation. He's angry. And notice what he's angry about. He's angry about this plant. This plant that God appointed that, that came to him and provided him this, this comfort. And so God asked Jonah this question. It's the same question, just with a different twist this time. He says, Jonah, do you do well to be angry? But notice how he ends it this time. Do you do well to do, be angry? For this plant. What? Do you, do you, do, and Jonah's response is, yes, I do well to be angry. Angry enough to die. God, you shouldn't have caused that plant to die. You shouldn't have come and caused it to wither. You shouldn't have taken it away from me, God. God, that's not right. God, that's not fair. And I'm angry about it. And then you get to the heart of what it is God's trying to teach Jonah. As Jonah admits what his focus is, God says this, You pity the plant, a plant for which you did not labor, nor did you make it grow, nor did you bring it into being in a night and make it perish in a night. See, Jonah, here, here's, here's the problem. You know what your focus is? You know what you care about, Jonah? You care about a plant. You care about something that is here one day and gone the next. That's where your focus is. That's the problem, Jonah. You only care about the temporal. Think about this. Jonah is more angry over the destruction of a plant than Jonah is the destruction of a people. He's more concerned about a little tree than he is people who are made in the very image of God. Jonah, you, you pity a plant. Your focus is on that which is temporal. 
It's about, it's about you, Jonah. It's just about your comfort, Jonah. And then you get to verse 10, or verse 11. And God says, Should I not pity Nineveh? That great city where there are more than 120,000 persons who do not know their right hand from their left and also much cattle. See the question that God poses to Jonah? Jonah, you're focused on something that is so temporary. But I pity something that's eternal. I pity people on their souls. I pity this great nation of people. Yeah, they're wicked. But he talks about this, these 120,000 people who do not know their right hand from their left hand. And there's a lot of speculation, you know, is that talking about children, 120,000 children plus parents and adults? Or is it just talking about the idea that people can't decipher between what's right and wrong? Listen, it doesn't matter. The point's the same. God cares about the people. God cares about the souls of the Ninevites. So here, here's, the, here's the message that God is trying to get across throughout the story of Jonah. It's this. God's priorities are different. God's priorities are different than man's priorities. You see, you want to know what God prioritizes? 1 Timothy chapter 2, as Paul is writing there to the young Timothy, and he begins that section telling him to, to pray for all people, people in high positions, kings, peoples in authority. He says, you know, you do that so you can live a peaceful and a, and a quiet life. And then in verse 3, he tells him this. Here, here's what he says. He says, because this is pleasing in the sight of God, our Savior, who, verse 4, he says, desires all people to be saved and come to the knowledge of of truth. You want to know where God's priorities are? God's priorities are that man becomes saved. God's priorities are souls. God's priority is people. The question that we have to ask ourselves is, is that our priority? Do my priorities reflect that I care about the salvation of other people? And church, if we're honest, the answer is no. It's no. You say, well, that's kind of harsh to well, maybe, maybe it is. But I'm as guilty as you are. I'm not just pointing the finger at you. Trust me, I'm pointing it back at me. I'm guilty. Because there are times I care more about plants than I do people. I care more about things that are temporary than I do things that are eternal. Think about the Apostle Paul. As he's writing to the church at Rome in Romans chapter 9. Paul begins that passage and he talks about how he has this deep anguish in his heart, this unquenching or unceasing, he says, sorrow. And here's the sorrow. It's over the fact that people are lost. He said his own kinmen are lost. They haven't come to know Jesus. And he says, if only I could be cut off from Christ for their sake. In other words, if only I could take their place. How important was the lost people for, for the Apostle Paul? He says, well, if I could switch places with them. But I can't. I think about Jesus as the last week of Jesus' life as Jesus rode, in, rode into Jerusalem in Luke chapter 19. And he looks about that city. And the Bible tells us Jesus weeps. We always think about John 11, Jesus weeping, but he wept in Luke 19 over the destruction that was to come to the city and to the people. You want to know what makes God weep? It's when the souls of people are lost. That's what makes God weep. You want to know what God's priority is? God's priority is not my happiness. God's priority is my holiness and wanting me to live out that holiness before others so that they can be holy too. That's what God wants. See, the question that we have to think about this morning is this. Do we care more about plants than we do people? You know, it's interesting you think about stories ending. The, the book of Jonah, had it ended at, at verse 10 of chapter 3, that would have been a great ending. 
But there's more to the story, and we, we get to see the heart of Jonah, and we see how Jonah resents God, God's grace. We see how Jonah sees sin differently. Ultimately, we see how Jonah's really just consumed with the temporary, his own comforts, and he misses out on what's most important, the salvation of souls. But here's what's interesting about the book of Jonah. As the book of Jonah ends, you notice how it ends there in verse 11? It ends with a question. It's one of only two books that end with a question. It ends with a question. Should I not pity Nineveh, this great city where there are more than 120,000 people who do not know their right hand from their left hand and many cattle? And that's the way the story ends. And we're left to wonder, what happened to Jonah? What was Jonah's response? How did Jonah answer? What did Jonah do? And we don't know. I'd like to think that You know, Jonah's the author of the book of Jonah. He writes the story that that's a pretty good indication that Jonah came to his senses. But that's just what I like to think, and I hope. But the Bible doesn't tell me. And maybe the Bible doesn't tell me because the story isn't really about Jonah. The story isn't even really about Nineveh. The story's about God and about the the God that, that we serve. And what God expects of those who serve him. You see, God caused a great fish to swallow up Jonah and to save Jonah so that Jonah could go and preach the good news to a people who needed to hear it. God sent Jesus Christ to this world to save you and me from our sins. And then God expects us to go and to tell others about that great love he has for them, about the salvation of their souls. That's God's priority. And that ought to be my priority as a follower of His. So this morning, I, as we close this, this lesson, I, I ask you, do you care more, more about things that are temporal? Things that are here one day and gone the next? Is that where your focus is? Do you care more for plants than you do for the people around you. People that you know that if today Jesus were to come back, they would be lost. That if today their life were to end and they were to stand before the Lord in judgment, they would hear, depart from me. I don't know you. And then I stand before God. And there's that individual They don't know him. God looks at me and God says, Justin, you spent your life caring about plants. You spent your life caring about the temporary. But you didn't care about the eternal. You weren't concerned about the people. And that person in horror crying out, Justin, you never mentioned him to me. What a haunting day that will be. So you and I, unlike Jonah, we don't know what happened with Jonah, but we can know what happens with our story. We can answer God's question, yes, God, it's not about the plants. It's about the people. I'm going to prioritize my life so that I desire what you desire. I want what you want, God. That should be our heart's desire this morning. If you're here this morning and you're not a Christian, you've never obeyed the gospel of Christ, you've never given your life to him in the watery grave of baptism, the water's ready. We want to assist you this morning. It's the greatest decision that you will ever make. Jesus said, he who believes and is baptized will be saved. Have you done that today? Are you saved? And if not, what are you waiting for? You're not promised tomorrow. You don't know what's going to happen when you leave here today. If you need to be immersed into Christ today for the forgiveness of your sins, Please do it. Do it today. But many of you here, you have been. We have been. But as we reflect on our life, maybe we realize, you know what? I haven't been living my life for Christ. I haven't been living as I need to live. I've placed a lot of focus on plants and very little on people. And there are people right now in my life who I know, who if nothing changes, who if I fail to say anything about to them about the good news of Jesus Christ, they're going to be eternally lost. 
asking, what kind of an account will I have to give for that? So maybe you need prayers this morning. We're going to have a shepherd down front. We want to pray with you. We want to pray for you. We want to pray for the people in your life who need prayers, who you want to study with, who you want to talk to, who you want to bring to Christ. That's what we want to do for you. And what a great opportunity we have today. May we learn from the story of Jonah about the heart of God. God desires grace and mercy to those who obey. Will we take the message to those who need to hear it? If you need to respond, won't you do so while we stand and sing? be seated.